So we're starting uh, this series on Daniel. It'd be great if you've got a Bible or a Bible app at home to have it open at Daniel chapter 1. Uh, and as we uh, heard in the uh, video a moment ago, uh, Jerusalem had been invaded by the Babylonians. God's place, Jerusalem, had been destroyed. The temple ransacked and left burning. And the people, God's people, had been conquered. Uh, and what conquering nations used to do was to scour the, the people uh, of the nations that they invaded and take their pick of the best and the brightest to bring back to their nation. And that's exactly what happened uh, in Daniel 1. And I say the best and the brightest because I mean the best and the brightest. Listen to how they're described in Daniel 1. Young, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude of every kind of learning, well-informed, fit, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Would you make the cut? Or maybe, maybe before lockdown. Uh, but Daniel and his friends were the Hebrew elite uh, and uh, as we heard in the reading, they were destined to be formed into the Babylonian elite. That was the king, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's plan. They were to be taught the language and the literature of the Babylonians. They were to have food and wine from the king's own table. And they were to be trained for three years. And you can see King Nebuchadnezzar being really clever here. Uh, can you see that the three-pronged attack that he mounts to get rid of God's people's distinctiveness. Uh, he he uh, tries to shape their minds, he tries to change their identities, and he tries to appeal to their hearts, to win their hearts. He wants to shape their minds, he wants to teach them to be Babylonians. And first he tries to teach them the language. I don't know how much uh, you know about learning a language, but I can assure you it's more than just learning vocab. Um, I was uh, doing Latin at school uh, uh, in, for GCSE. I'm not quite sure how I ended up doing Latin GCSE, but I did. And that was just learning lists of vocab, lists of what words meant. Because, of course, we couldn't go to ancient Rome and, uh, you know, practice the language. But actually, learning a language now is much more about uh, learning the words, but also learning their cultural meaning, isn't it? The best way to learn the language, they say, is to go to a place and to live among the people of that place. And, uh, and you, you pick up on the, the uh, idiosyncrasies of the language. So learning the Babylonian language didn't just mean learning the words. It meant becoming like a local. And even more so with the literature that they were being taught. The world of the Babylonians was a world of uh, priests, expert magicians, uh, astrology, philosophy. And learning their literature would have meant uh, uh, delving into all of that. Learning incantations, prayers, myths, legends about the gods of Babylon. And their training uh, for the king's service, Daniel and his friends, would have had to study and become masters of this literature. So the king was shaping their minds. He also went for their identities, didn't he? Did you spot that? Uh, the chief official gave them new names, which Mark dealt very well with, all of them. Uh, Daniel, uh, the name Belteshazzar, uh, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. And you can see it's another nail in the distinctiveness coffin here, isn't it? It's not just a simple name change. Names meant so much more then uh, than they tend to now. In Hebrew, Daniel means God is my judge. And that's referring to the God of Israel, Yahweh, Daniel's God. But it wouldn't work having one of the, Hebrew, one of the Babylonian elite walking around being called uh, the, the Hebrew God is my judge. And so they changed it to Belteshazzar. Shazzar means protecting the king, and Bel apparently being another name for the chief uh, Babylonian god Marduk. So uh, God is my judge, Yahweh is my judge, becomes Marduk, protect the king. And each of the other names meant something different to do with the Babylonian gods. Nebuchadnezzar tries to shape their minds, and he tries to change their identities. And then he tries to win their hearts. And what's the route to someone's heart? 
Uh, well, certainly uh, two people in my family, uh, the route to our hearts is certainly what's going on the dinner table. Um, that's me and Emma, and I can uh, recount to you a, a conversation that happened uh, between me and my youngest Emma the other day. In one of those days between Christmas and New Year, that you can never remember which date is which, um, and we had had a walk out on the beach with the dog, and we were coming home for tea, and Emma uh, came up beside me and said, with a twinkle in her eye, I've just found out what we're having for tea. And she was really excited, and then I started to get really excited because food motivates both of us. And uh, she said, uh, we're having leftovers in bubble and squeak. And already I was excited. I mean, everyone loves leftovers, but put them all in a pan and fry them up together, even better. But I could see there was more. There was a bigger gleam in her eye as she leaned in uh, to my ear and said, with sausages. And my day was instantly made 100% better. Hearing that we were going to have leftovers in bubble and squeak with sausages uh, changed how I was feeling right then. And the king tries to do exactly the same to Daniel and his friends. The king, we're told, assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from his table. The best food, the, the uh, choicest wine from the king's own table. They were being literally treated like kings. And it was a glimpse. It was a glimpse of what it could be like if they studied hard and they submitted to the king. They could be in the club, part of the Babylonian elite. That's what was being laid out in front of them. Membership into this club. Daniel and his friends. All this could be yours. I don't know if you know uh, the origin of that phrase, all this could be yours, but uh, you can uh, read it in... Uh, uh, in the Bible, uh, when Jesus is taken out to a, a, a solitary place and tempted by the devil. We'll be thinking about that uh, again later on when Lent starts. Uh, but that's our second reading today. We're not going to have it read out now, but if you've got your Bibles there, you can see it in Matthew chapter 4. And uh, Satan takes uh, Jesus up to a high mountain and he lays the world out before him and says, all this could be yours. Daniel was being given the same with Babylon. All this could be yours. What would you choose? Babylon stands there before you and says, your nation's been conquered. Your holy city has been burned. Your temple has been ransacked. The articles of your God have been taken out of your temple and displayed as spoils in another God's treasure house. And then you're offered this choice, become one of us. Not just one of us, but one of the best of us. Become one of the Babylonian elite. Just sign up to our culture, pledge allegiance to the king, subscribe to our worldview, and you're in. Maybe that seems far away, but maybe we can rephrase it. Take it out of Babylon and ground it closer to home. What would you choose? Society stands before you. As it so often does, I was reading an article in a paper the other day that said almost exactly this. Society stands before you and says, your church is in decline. Your practices are archaic. Your scriptures uh, need to be uh, thrown out or at least changed to fit in with modern culture. Your beliefs are outdated or ridiculous or both. See sense, see reason, join us. Just like uh, Daniel being tempted, uh, just like Jesus having all that laid before him and being tempted. We're tempted as we look around the world, aren't we, in different ways. But Daniel 1 says, but Daniel resolved. This is the start of Daniel's stand. Those three words, but Daniel resolved. It looks like he's going to make a stand. What's he going to say? But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. It's getting better. He's really going to show them what's what. He's going to show them what he believes. He's going to tell them uh, what he believes in his heart. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Wait, what? Out of all of those things, that's what Daniel's got a problem with. 
Strange, isn't it? He accepts deportation. He accepts re-education. He accepts a name change. But he draws the line at what he's going to eat and drink. What's going on here? What's so special about the food uh, and wine from the king's table? Is it a health thing? As the video suggested earlier, was Daniel the first nutritionist? Because we see what happens. He asks for him and his friend to be excused the rich food and the choice wine and instead have vegetables and water. Whether uh, Hananiah and the others uh, agreed with that or not, or whether they were trying to grab the last steaks off the table as they were taken away, I don't know. But sure enough, Daniel and his friends have only vegetables and water. And after 10 days, in the lineup with the others who have been eating the king's food, they look the healthiest and most nourished. So do we all just take on the Daniel diet? Is that the, uh, the, the teaching from Daniel 1? Should we all become vegetarian? Well, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but no. There's something more going on here. Sharing the king's table is about more than food, isn't it? It's about entering into a dependent relationship with the king. In fact, food in that culture meant a a huge amount more than just uh, uh, nourishment, than just what we put in our bodies. Food then, accepting food, was a a covenant. Being fed from the king's own table was to look to him for your daily bread. Where in our lives do we see that temptation? Where in our lives do we see uh, the the things offering us um, money, success, enjoyment, an easier life? in return for our allegiance. Okay, it might not be uh, allegiance to a king, but there are plenty of things that we can ally ourselves to uh, in return for those things, aren't there? We can see the draw of of money in so many ways. The Bible talks about the love of money uh, turning into an idol, turning into a god, turning into uh, our king, if you like. I was reading a statistic the other day while I was procrastinating and putting off doing my tax return. Uh, And the statistic says this, uh, that between 36 and 60% of uh, people in the UK, when they fill in their tax return, uh, admit to being happy to uh, being creative with the truth. We can ally ourselves with a world that suggests it's okay to be creative on our tax returns. Who's it really hurting? Do you see how we can ally ourselves with a a way of thinking or a a thing that uh, that, uh, we pledge allegiance to? We can ally ourselves with an attitude that says it doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. I was reading another statistic the other day as I was researching this Uh, sermon, it says this, in 2019, one in 25 university students admitted to taking up some sort of work in the adult industry because the payout seems easy and lucrative, was the quote. We can ally ourselves to a way of thinking that says, uh, it doesn't matter what we say, it doesn't matter about being honest. We can ally ourselves to a way of thinking, saying it doesn't matter uh, how we use our bodies. And there are lots of different ways we can pledge allegiance to uh, things that the world says rather than uh, to what God says, aren't there? When Jesus was tempted... Uh, Satan laid out all those things before him. And they were good things. It wasn't even that they were bad things. They were good things. And he says, all of this could be yours. It's amazing how we look through the Old Testament and we see these main characters like Daniel pointing forward to Jesus, being foreshadows of, of Christ. Daniel had all that laid before him. All this could be yours. But he makes this radical stand. He turns down the lavish gifts from Nebuchadnezzar's table. What's going to happen? What's the upshot? Did uh, his friends fail to make the grade? Were they thrown out for being disloyal? 
at the end of the uh, chapter, verse 18, it says this. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They entered the king's service. Because they studied hard, because they were the brightest students, because they ate vegetables? No, because God. It's all the way through the chapter, isn't it? Because God. Verse 2, and the Lord delivered Jerusalem into the hands of the Babylonian king. He put them there in the first place. Uh, Verse 9, now God caused the official to show favor to Daniel. He paves the way. Verse 17, to those four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of literature and learning and dreams and visions. God made them prosper. Eating vegetables is fine, but it was God who made them prosper. Friends, when we're tempted to ally ourselves elsewhere, it can be because we're not sure that God's going to provide what we need. Maybe more and more in uh, our situation at the moment with the world as it is. Often, of course, it can be because we want more than we need. Either way, Daniel is an example to us today, isn't he? Those three words, but Daniel resolved. He looked to God. What what practical ways can we be doing that? I was thinking the other day, what about grace? Uh, Praying grace before you eat seems quite an outdated thing, doesn't it? It's something the Victorians really did a lot. But uh, actually it's a statement, isn't it? Praying before you eat is a statement. You're saying, I I know who this food came from. Ultimately, not just Tesco or the Sussex peasant. I know who this food came from and I'm thanking you, God, for it. What about grace before our tax returns too? Maybe that's a good idea. I'll be doing mine still within the bracket of time. I know it's late, uh, but I'll be doing mine. And when I write my name at the top of that form, it will say Daniel, not Belteshazzar. It will be a reminder. What about if we were to pray before we did things like our tax returns? Thank you, God, for the money that you've given me, for the resources that you've given me. Uh, Reminding ourselves who it's from and asking him to use, uh, for us to use it wisely and well. What about if we pray before uh, all these little things that we do in our lives? Just like grace, reminding ourselves who it is that provides us with these things. We'll hear later on in Daniel that Daniel prayed regularly doing just that. That's what helped Daniel to resolve. Well, let's pray that he'll be an example to us, shall we? Father God, that word resolve is such a hard thing to do sometimes because we see our world and we see uh, what we need or, or often what we think we need and we see ways of getting it. But Father, so often those ways are ways that take us away from uh, you and make us pledge allegiance to others or other things or ways of thinking. Father, help us, just like Daniel, to resolve to follow you. Show us those things in our lives where we can uh, pray beforehand and uh, ask you to uh, help us use them wisely. And Father, just like you did with Daniel, we... uh, Claim that promise that you will bless us through that. In Jesus' name, amen.